Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. We uh, continue the story of Yosef today. We are seeing in, in, in multiple stages his life over multiple Parsha. I mean, from last one through really the end of this book, we're talking about not just Jacob, not just Israel, but Yosef and the relevance between uh, Jacob and Israel and uh, Yosef and how all this is coming together. We see there is a, a family that was divided, but we see there's a restoration that's coming. And it's really interesting how all of this comes together. You know, um, in the life of Yosef, we, we've we kind of touched on before about there's a there's a lot of similarities. We see Yosef as a type of Messiah and as a, uh, a shadowing the Messiah and the work that he would do as feeding the world, the bread of life. Um, multiple things going on, bringing restoration to the people. We're going to talk about a little bit on that part today. We're going to talk about uh, family. We're going to talk about how Israel was divided. They were separated. They're uh, fighting amongst one another, but they're starting to come together. They're starting to see how they need to, to be one, but they don't really realize how all this is coming into play yet. Uh, because Yosef, his identity is covered over. Who he is and what has to uh, happen in his life is, is still a process, right? We know that Yahweh worked a big deal into the life of Yosef and, and how he's grown. He's gone through a lot of problems, right? He's, he's been through quite a bit. I mean, he was sold into slavery. But we do know that Yahweh used these circumstances that was going on in his life to set and position Yosef into a place where he could bring restoration. And we do also see that uh, this is part of what Yahweh had told Avraham would happen to his descendants, that they would end up uh, being in, in a place that is not their own. They would become enslaved. They would be there 400 years, but they will come out. And Yosef is a pivotal point in that about Israel going into exile, going into a place that is not their own, but and, and, and being oppressed. But in that turn, discovering who they are, who they really are, and, and crying out to Yahweh and then coming out and to be gathered into a people to have their own place. And, and how all this happens, we see throughout the rest of the Tanakh. But Today, I want to bring out a very interesting point. We're not going to go back to the beginning of the story of Yosef. We're actually going to start a chapter in in this Parsha. We're going to go to chapter 42. And if you look at verse 5, it says, Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was great. Uh, it was great. And it was in the land of Canaan. So this famine was all over the, the known world at the time. Okay? Not just in Egypt, but it was all over. Now, granted, the famine that was in the rest of the world was not the same reason why there was a famine in Egypt. Because in Egypt, because the Nile uh, overflowed and it fed the crops and watered and they got their sustenance, their life here, right? We were reliant on that. The rest of the world, no rain. Yeah. <laughs> so the similarity is still there. There's a famine because there wasn't the water that was needed. But the time was right for Yosef to come into place. Now, again, not going into Pharaoh's dreams, not going into how Yosef was uh, immediately brought out of, uh, out, out of the, the, the dungeon, brought out of the pit, if you will, and brought to Pharaoh and, and how Pharaoh put him in charge. This is the extreme uh, Reader's Digest version of the events that have taken place. But Yosef is now in charge of, of all Mitzrayim, of all Egypt, right? And so here, um, his brothers are in a place now where they realize they uh, they can't stay here. They can't, I mean, the, the food they have here is scarce, but they know there's food in Egypt. So they have to go down to Egypt to get it. Now, you may ask yourself, why would they all have to go down? Why can't just one of them go as a representative on all? Well, it is speculated that they would give uh, provisions to each household. To each head of each household. Well, these are multiple brothers with multiple families, multiple children. So they would each have to go on behalf of their own household, right? And then one of them could represent uh, uh, Jacob because they would be, you know, he would probably be staying with one of his boys, right? So again, all this comes into play. 
All right. So what happens here is very interesting because in this verse is the very first time we see the phrase sons of Israel being used in the Torah. So what relevance does that have to do with anything? Because we see the phrase sons of Israel in the context of being mixed among all those from uh, the known world at the time, those from the other nations coming to Yosef and, and coming to him to buy the grain that they need to sustain them and, and to do that. But the point being, the sons of Israel are being mixed in with the nations as they're gathering together. See, and that is very prophetic because we see, again, throughout the history of Israel, they have been in places of exile and places of return. Well, we find in the scripture where Yosef, Ephraim, was scattered into all the nations, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, but we do not see where all of the people have returned, where all of the tribes that are represented in all the nations have returned and came back. So this is a very prophetic speaking of Israel being among all the nations, but they will be coming together. Okay, so it's, it's real interesting when we look at all that. Let's take a quick look at this. Zechariah 8, 22 and 23 says, so many people and strong nations shall come to seek Yahweh Tzavaot in Jerusalem and to pray before Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh Tzavaot in those days, it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him who is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, the interesting thing here is when you see all the nations being talked about in scripture, you most often hear the number 70 being given, but it says 10 men from from all the nations, speaking all languages, will come to you. So where is this 10 that represents all the nations? This 10 that represents all the nations is Yosef, those that have been scattered into all the nations, but yet they will return. Now we see in Ezekiel's prophecy that uh, there are those who will come back from these tribes in all Israel, but there will be those that join with them in coming back. And that's what we see here in Zechariah. In Zechariah, we see people from all the nations and the, tr the 10 tribes and those as well, all to every trunk, every tribe, every nation. Does this sound familiar? Kind of uh, the book of Revelation kind of talking here, right? So all of these people will come and they will gather in and grab hold of the, the skirt of him who is a Jew or the edge of the garment of him who is a Jew saying, we will go with you for we have heard God is with you. And I believe this Jew that is referenced here is Yeshua, is the Mashiach. Okay, so they come to him and they say, we will go with you. We have heard God is with you. So all the nations will come back, return to Israel in Messiah Yeshua. And again, this is, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture that we see here because uh, we know that Yeshua said he's come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we see that he is coming back and returning to bring all people. The goal is that we all come back into one kingdom, have one shepherd. He will rule over us. And, and that's, that's what we're looking forward to. We're not quite there yet. We, we're still a people divided. But the idea is that we come together and, uh, and we learn this restoration that the Father wants us to be involved in and be a part of. Okay, now uh, let's keep going in our story. So in Genesis 42, verses 7 and 8, So Yosef saw his brothers, and he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. So where do you come from, he said, and, and they said, from, from the land of Canaan, and to buy food. And Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Now, there's something very interesting that I want to point out here in these verses. Okay, first off, Yosef saw his brothers and recognized them. It says, but he made himself strange to them. Some say he treated them like strangers. But literally, how this reads is vayet uh, nacher, which means to make yourself strange or to appear like another to appear like someone else. Now, we already know he was already shaved, uh, new clothes. He looked like an Egyptian. He, after all, was an Egyptian ruler. There is no reason why any of his brothers would assume that he is anyone else, right? Obviously. But he, but he was concealed. He concealed his true identity that he was a Hebrew. He was one of the sons of Israel. 
And so this was concealed from them. And it says, and he spoke roughly to them, Alehem. And so where do you come from, uh, Alehem? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So here he's, he's speaking, uh, you say roughly to them, but he is speaking in a manner that would be expected. You know, I've never seen you before. Who are you? What do you want? What are you doing here? I mean, they're being interrogated, right? So he, they come before him, and they did not recognize him. Now, Yosef knew that this is my brothers I am dealing with, but the brothers did not know that uh, this is Yosef. So um, the, his identity was concealed to them. So here I have this. Does Yosef's brothers recognize him? Even today, does Yosef's brothers recognize him? Even today, Micah 2.12 says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. That's who? That's all of Yaakov. That's all Israel. That's all the tribes. I will gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in his pasture, a noisy multitude of men. Ezekiel 28.25 says, Thus says the Lord God, when I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and manifest my holiness in them in the sight of where the nations, then they shall dwell in their own land that I gave to my servant Yaakov. So again, we have here, uh, Yahweh is saying he will gather in from all the nations and we don't recognize each other as a part of Israel right now. You know, we say we believe in the God of, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But how many people who, who say that really, truly believe that they are a part of a people called Israel? Now, not replacing Israel, but we see things like Ephesians 2, you are part of the commonwealth of Israel, like Romans 11, being grafted in to the tree, right? So you are a part of Israel. All right. So Yosef sees his brothers. He recognized them for who they are. But the brothers have yet to recognize Yosef for who he is. Right. So, again, we see here Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. OK, they did not recognize. So, again, when you care, Yosef, et achiv, et achav. so he, he recognizes Alaftaf, his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And. I'm going to submit to you this uh, part of the idea. If you say as, as Yosef as part of a Messiah type figure as a uh, shadow of Yeshua and the things that he would come to do makes us think of the scripture where it says in John chapter one, that he was in the world. The world was made by him. The world didn't know him. He came to his own and his own received them not. But as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So again, we have this picture of uh, being called sons of God, which go back into sons of Israel as well, right? Being grafted in, being part of Israel. It's a place of covenant. It's a place of position. But this identity is being concealed, covered over, waiting for the right time. We, we Again, we see scripture like for the sons of God to be revealed, right? Waiting for the right time for this revealing of uh, all those that have been called and, and what's really going on and what's really happening here. I submit to you that there are many people who, who don't know who they are. Uh, but Yahweh is revealing what he has called us by his name and, and what he has called us to be as well. So there's this covering and revealing that we see throughout Scripture. Um, I'm thinking Isaiah 42, 16 says, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not, and I will lead them in paths that they have not known, and I will make darkness light before them and the crooked things straight. These things will I do to them, and I will not forsake them. And I'm thinking of here, it says, and I will bring them the blind by the way they didn't know. So the word there for blind is Ivrim. Ivrim. Okay, it's uh, from the word avar, but it's not spelled the same way you would spell Hebrew. Okay, it's, it's the, the ein, the vav, and the resh, which means like a film over the eyes, like a, something that is blind, something that is over the eyes, scales, a film over the eyes, or something that is prohibiting you from seeing, there, so it is blind. But there is a time where he says that you know, these dark things, you've been blind, but I will open your eyes. Okay, and, and this word for, uh, uh, again, related to Hebrew, Hebrew is ein bet resh. So we can be blind, but if we allow ourselves to be joined to his house, that's the bet, the vav is the join, 
If we allow ourselves to be joined to his house, then we will be Hebrew, we will see. Okay, so though we be blind, we will see. How does this happen? To be joined to his house, to be joined to Yahweh, to be joined to a people, because we know a house doesn't represent like a literal four walls, right? Uh, it's, it, it's representing that which dwells within the house, the people, the family. So here we have people that are being joined to his house, that though we were blind, that we now see, okay? Uh, Psalm 83 Verses 1 through 4, we read, uh, Keep not silent, O God. Hold not your peace, and be not still, O God. For, for lo, your enemies make a tumult, and they that hate you have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people. They have consulted against who? Your hidden ones. The one It says your hidden ones is the word Safan, which means uh, a covering over that is said, uh, Zephania is, is God has secreted. So your hidden ones, those that are covered over, those that are uh, concealed, those that are yet to be revealed. And what is the plan of these that are trying to cover over those that Yah has secreted? Well, verse four. So they have come and they said, let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. You know, there are things and times and periods throughout Scripture where Yahweh has hidden things waiting for the right time for them to be revealed. That doesn't mean it's not there. It just means he's waiting for the right time for that which was hidden to be revealed. And we see this in other places in Scripture as well, like Luke. Luke 10, 21 says, in the, in the same hour he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit, and he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to his disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the, are, are, are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So he's saying there are things that are revealed that are waiting for the, for the people's eyes to be opened, those who have the eyes to see, the ears to hear. Ever wonder why Yeshua ever said things like that? You know, if you have the ears to hear, or if you have the eyes to see, right? So these are things that we see in the scripture. If we set ourselves to the Father, he will reveal things that... Uh, it's there. It's just kind of covered over, waiting for the right time to be revealed. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9, uh, Shaul, he says, To me, the least important of all God's holy people was given the privilege of announcing to the Gentiles the good news of the Messiah's unfathomable riches and of letting everyone see how the secret plan is going to work out. The plan kept hidden for ages by God, the creator of everything. Now, Shaul, why would he say something like this? Something that's secret or waiting for something that's being to revealed or some things that have been hidden, mysteries. All of these things are talking about like uh, when he says all creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. All of this is saying the, the people who were in the nations waiting for the time, right? To, to, to come back and to be revealed. How about you used to be Gentiles? You used to be foreigners. You used to not have a place in covenant. But now, in the Messiah Yeshua, you are brought in to be part of the commonwealth of Israel. All of these things, they're things that you don't really see in the scripture, but it's there. Uh, once you see it, it's kind of hard to not see it, you know, but it is there. Uh, Yeshua saying, I have not come but to, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All of this are things that are being revealed in this time. Why? Because this is a time for a revealing. This is a time to bring this reconciliation and this restoration of all Israel back together. You know, Yeshua says we need to be people that are gathering. Well, what are we doing when the whole world is telling you to stay away, stay away, stay away? And um, Yeshua says we're supposed to be gathering in together. Now, yeah, this is uh, partially like into the kingdom, absolutely. But I do believe it also attests to gathering in with one another as well. It's hard to develop uh, a relationship with someone unless you spend a little bit of time with them. 
right? So there has to be this gathering together that's in there, okay? And there has to be recognizing the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel before this restoration can take place, okay? We have to see each other as brothers. We have to see each other as having the same father. We have to see each other as being part of the same family before we can truly work together with one another and bring this restoration that the father is desiring to do in our midst. A couple things need to happen here. In order for this reconciliation to occur, two main things have to happen. One, Yosef has to be able to change his, uh, his attitude or his opinion towards his brothers. And Yosef's brothers have to change their view of Yosef. In other words, let me kind of put it this way. They would all have to change how they viewed and how they received one another. On both sides, they would have to... to change their perception of the other party. You know, Yosef would have to look at his brothers and say, you know, I, I, I have a hard time looking at the past here. I have a hard time saying, well, you sold me into slavery. You, you wanted me to go to bondage. But again, did they really? You know, I mean, they threw him in the pit. They plotted to do it. Right. They did all these things, but the, the traders came by, lifted them out and they took them away. So more more food for thought. They're going down another trail. I'm not going to do that at this time. But he's looking at his brother saying, you know, all these things that have happened in the past, though, they put me in a place and in a position where I can literally save the world. Because I am now working to, to give literally the food that will sustain you and the food that will keep you going in these hard times. I'm here now because of what happened back then. So this is why he tells his brothers a little later what was intended uh, for harm. God turned it and, ma and used it, made it good. And we find scripture re relating to that as well in Romans, right? So again, the brothers have to change their view of Yosef. Oh, look at the dreamer. Look at the one who's always bringing bad reports about us. I mean, they, they hated him. They despised him. Scripture says that they could not speak any words of peace to him at all. They hated him. And they had to get to the place where they actually don't hate him, where they start to see him. Yes, he is our brother. He, we are family, and there has to be this relationship that we can work between us. All of this going into place. And something that's very interesting happens next as well. I mean, the, the, the point of this being, have you ever said something and not realized what you said until something later, until like after the fact, realized uh, you said something, but wow, that, that goes a little further than I thought, right? Well, this is something that we can look back on and, and kind of see. And, and, and here's a, a little bit of a laugh. Um, so in Genesis 42, 9 through 11, so Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them, that they would all come and bow, right? They would all come and bow before him. And he said to them, you're spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. Look at verse 11. And they said, we are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. And interesting, because he says, we're all sons of one man. Literally, kulanu b'nei ish echad. We are all sons of one man. The interesting and the funny thing about this is the brothers are there. They're talking about, so us all standing here, we're all sons of one man. But even in regard to Yosef standing before them, we are all sons of one man. Huh. See, they're, 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 they're speaking here that we all have the same father not even really realizing that they're including Joseph in that as well. But that is part of the key to this bringing restoration that needs to happen, to bringing uh, the whole family of Israel back together. All right, let's keep moving. In uh, chapter 42, verse 14, uh, Yosef said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. Verse 18. On the third day, Yosef said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain from, uh, for the famine of your household. 
and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die and they did so now the interesting thing here he locks them all up and he waits for three days why i mean he's, he doesn't plan on holding them indefinitely he wants to send them back because i mean his dad needs food the families need food so he he's going to send them back but why why three days i, I think he wanted to let them sit and contemplate things for a little bit right and then he wanted to show them um, I do have good intentions here, but I need to see your youngest son. And he says to make sure that you're telling me the truth of who you guys are. But uh, we all know, kind of know and have the idea. He just wanted to make sure his brother was OK and that his other brothers didn't do to him what was done to Yosef. Right. So there, there's more we can talk about there. But again, the whole three day thing and coming out of the prison in three days, there's a lot to this three day thing. Right. Well, let's look at Hoshea chapter six, verse one it says, uh, come, let us return to Yahweh. For he has torn us that he may heal us and he has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. So we find here Israel was bound up for three days. And on the third day, they were released with the charge to go back to the son of the right hand and bring him back. However, Shimon was withheld until they returned. Why Shimon? Because Reuben, you know, was the oldest, right? Well, when they were arguing amongst themselves, he heard uh, that Reuben had said, hey, didn't I tell you not to do this, right? So the next in line would have been Shimon. So he, he, he withholds Shimon. But it's interesting because Shimon, the word Shema, right, is to hear. Uh, the one who hears, the son who hears. So he sends them back, but he withholds their hearing for, for them for a time. And he says, I want you to bring back and come when you return, come with the son of the right hand, come with a covenant, come with promise, really, is what he's saying here, right? Let's look at this. Uh, Shimon was their hearing, was bound up and withheld from them for a time, but their hearing would be restored to them upon their brothers proving that they had cared for Benjamin. And uh, makes me think Romans 11, 8. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see or ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now, we got to go a little further in Romans. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. says, brothers, I want you to understand this truth which God formerly concealed, but now has revealed, so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters into its fullness. Um, and this is until the uh, fullness of the Gentiles come in, right? These are some things we're looking at. And, and when we're talking about this, we're talking about Maloha Goyim, those who filled the nations, not just uh, people of the nations, but those who filled the nations. If you go back to the blessing that was given to Joseph's sons, uh, it is said specifically that Ephraim will be Maloha Goyim, the ones who fill the nations. And we see throughout the scripture, Israel has done that. You know, the uh, northern tribes went in and they filled the nations because of idolatry. But there is a time and continuing prophecies throughout the Tanakh that they will return, that all Israel shall return. Back to Romans 11. Verse 26, and it is in this way that all Israel shall be saved, as the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer, and he will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov, and this will be my covenant with them when I will take away their sins. Now we go to Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39. Yeshua says, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, you kill the prophets, you stone those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children, just as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you refused. Look, God is abandoning your house to you, leaving it desolate. For I tell you, from now on, you will not see me again till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. You will not see me again until you are, until you are prepared to receive me for who I am. Now think about this in relationship to Yosef's brothers. He, hold, he withholds their hearing from them and sends them back into their land and says, 
don't come back until you come back with the son of covenant, until you come back with the, uh, the son of the right hand. And the idea here being you're going into the nations, but when you come back, you're going to have things revealed to you. Okay, so this is something that we're looking at. Uh, though, though Israel be scattered, they shall, they shall come back and be restored. Okay, so Yosef, he made a way for all to be saved because he opened all the storehouses. You know, not some, he opened all the storehouses. But the only ones who received the provision that were in the storehouses were the ones who would come to gather it. You know, if they wanted the grain, they had to come get it. They couldn't uh, just be wherever they were throughout the world and, and expect Yosef to go knocking door to door to drop off the grain throughout all the world. No, see, if they wanted the grain, they had to come to Yosef to get it. And this is something that we have to see for ourselves. If the Father has provision for you, he has life for you, he has the bread of life that you need. He has the things that you need, but you have to come to him to get it, much like the manna in the wilderness. If you, it was there for you, you need it, get it. It's right there. Okay. So again, this is part of our responsibility. And this is again, where we see uh, Israel working responsibly. You know, they have to see what is before them and they have to go do it much like Jacob, when he tells his sons, uh, guys, what are you sitting around here for? There's grain in Egypt. Get it, right? <laughs> Let's keep on with the story. So they ha the time comes when they have to go back, and, um, and, and, and they have to go back to buy more grain. It's interesting how it puts this, because it's not like they went back, got Benjamin, and went immediately back, right? No, this is a period of time where <laughs> the, the, it's, time has passed, okay? So things, the, things have... Uh, transpired between now and then how long have they been gone we don't really know long enough for the food that they were given to start getting scarce and they have to go back again they were scared to return okay and part of that was because uh, jacob was holding on to benjamin He's, he didn't want benjamin to go down right but there's a few things that we see here okay um let's back up genesis 42 21 and 22 so then they say to one another, in truth, we're guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of a soul when he begged us and we did not listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. Again, they didn't listen, right? And Reuben said, did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, uh, but you didn't listen. So now there comes this reckoning for his blood. So the brothers, they go back and they return home. But the silver that they had brought was in their sacks. Uh, this could have reminded them of Yosef, too, because their silver being returned to them and Shimon being left behind. They're down another brother and they have silver now, right? Um, now they run out of food again. Yaakov makes this, it makes this weird statement. He, he says that he lost Yosef and Shimon. Now you want me to lose Benjamin, too? I mean, he's think of this in, in, um, in, in Jacob's mind. Hey, every time you guys leave home as a group and come back, I have a, I have, I'm one less son. You know, every time you guys leave and come back, you're missing somebody. What's going on here, right? Um, but there's more that's going to happen. And we see some statements that could be taken prophetically as well as we continue in this. But what happens here is that Judah guarantees Benjamin's safety. And in before he, he had made the comment before he had said, let's kill our brother. But now he's promising the safety. He's going to watch out and, and look over uh, Benjamin, right? He's, he's now getting to the place where he's prepared to lay his life down for his brothers. And we find again in John where Yeshua says, no greater love is, has a man than to lay his life down for his friends, lay his life down for his brother. Uh, Genesis 43, 14. So this is what is said. He says, may God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man so that he will release Simeon, Shimon, and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my children, so be it. That's kind of a harsh statement, right? I mean, if you think, look at it this way, we go down and take our chances with what's going to happen. If we don't, we're all going to die. I mean, consider that. The famine was severe, right? If the famine's really bad, you know, people die in famine. So this famine is really severe. So we either go take our chances with, with what's going to happen here with this man or we're all going to die. So what do we do? Right? So, but he says uh, some interesting things. If we, if we kind of dissect this verse a little bit, we see, uh, may El Shaddai give you mercy to release Shimeon, Shimeon, Shimon, and to let Benjamin return. 
So if we break this down, we see, May El Shaddai, God Almighty, who is the watchman of all Israel, may he give you mercy, may he extend to you compassion to release your hearing so that you will hear and do. Shema is to hear and to do, to let Benjamin return, to let the son of the right hand or the son of strength and blessing return. It's because we know that when he returns, some may be lost, but some will be will be restored and some will be found this is kind of prophetic isn't it that when the hearing among israel is released that the son of the promise will return huh again let's let's keep moving forward genesis 43 16 so when uh, Joseph saw Benjamin with them, and he said to the ruler of his house, bring these men home and slay and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. So we see here uh, Yosef, who was the ruler of the known world at the time, he saw his brothers coming to him and all Israel coming to him. And he says, prepare the place and to come and to dine with me. Now, now consider this um, Egyptian culture, Hebrew culture. Egyptians did not eat with Hebrews. They were abhorrent to them. OK, so they did not eat with Hebrews. But here we have this ruler of the world who is saying, as he's seeing these Hebrews come to him, saying, uh, my brothers are coming back. My brothers are, are, are being restored. Look at all this. This is Benjamin. Here they are and prepare the banquet and let's get ready for this. OK, so again, come to my house and it makes me think again of Yeshua. After he rose, he appeared to his disciples and we'll look in John chapter 21. Uh, it says, Yeshua says to them, bring of the fish which you have now caught. And Shimon, again, interesting, Shimon went up and he drew the net uh, to the land full of great fishes, 153, which relates to the phrase sons of Elohim, by the way. And for all, there were so many, yet the net was not broken. And Yeshua says to them, come and dine. And none of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? Because they knew that it was Yeshua, right? Now, again, looking a little for, for, further forward in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 19, verse 9. The angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who invited to the merit supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So again, there's pictures here of when we come back, there's a banquet, there is a feast that is set up before. And even Yeshua gave a hint of that uh, to his disciples as well. So and it, recurring themes that we see within the scripture, right? Ultimately, what we're looking at is a restoration and a reconciliation of all Israel, those who are called by the name of Yahweh, and um, the idea that we need to learn as family to work together towards one kingdom, one heart, one king, and have one shepherd over us all, right? Uh, Genesis 43, 26. So when Joseph came home, they brought him to the house and, and, and uh, to present, or <laughs> let me start over. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with him and he bowed to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well? And the old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. So interesting because verses 27 and 28, the word shalom in the Hebrew is used three times. I mean, right back to back right here when it's talking about them. Um, interesting because if we go back earlier in the relationship, back earlier in the book of Bereshit, uh, between Yosef and his brothers, it says specifically that they were at a place with each other where they could not speak shalom toward him at all. They could not speak uh, literally the word shalom or, the, or even things of peace to him, or they could not speak peaceably to him at all. Everything that was done between the brothers toward Yosef uh, was malicious or, or had a evil intent or just hatred, you know, because remember, they hated him. So all of this was there. And uh, now here we see this conversation where Shalom is being repeated over and over in, in the idea here. And again, what does it have to do with us again? OK, so guys, when we start to come toward one another, even though there are problems, even though there are things that are happening, we have to be able to speak Shalom toward one another and see there's something greater going on in our midst. Okay, 
Uh, again, Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. This is the heart of the Father, that he brings restoration and reconciliation to all Israel. But before that, this can happen, we have to start to see each other as part of the same family. Uh, yes, he is our Abba, he is our Father. We don't have a problem with that. The problem comes in when we start seeing each other as siblings. And that's what we have to do. We have to see each other as as the same family working towards the same goal. Again, life in the kingdom. Being gathered in together to show the heart of the Father to a world that really needs it. All right. So these are the things that we want to pursue and that we want to think about. And uh, again, next week's portion, we have Joseph actually being revealed. And uh, that changes life for all Israel. And a lot of things tend to happen there. Not getting into that now. We'll see where that leads to next week.